So today what, what we will do is we will sort of consolidate a little bit what we've learned in the last two weeks about Golang. And I will summarize some of the, some of the concepts and some of the things that, that we do. Uh, and I will use it, um, I will use a code review to review some of the code that we have in the repository to sort of point out some, some aspects and to, to do a little bit of an update of the code. So first, we, we're going to talk a little bit about concurrency and a little bit about this client server implementation that is in the repository. Uh, so let's, let's open that up. And I will demonstrate how it, how it works, what's the idea behind this. So if I go <clears throat> if I go to the chat, so let's open two new terminals and I will make them bigger and I will go to projects chat. All right, so I will have three windows. Three ter terminal windows. Perfect. Um, I will build it in the main one. So go build command. And then there is only one, one file called server. So when I build a server, um, I have a server which opens a socket connection and allows incoming connection on port 666, 6666. And then uh, the server when it receives something on the standard input, it prints it here uh, on the screen, but it does, the server doesn't read anything from the standard input. It only kind of echoes what's happening inside the system. So the server will print it onto the screen and it will broadcast it to all the clients. So when um, a connection is made to the server, the server needs to keep track of who has connected to the server. So let me run the server and the server opens a connection on the uh, 6666 port and waits for anybody to connect and we can allow it from uh, from anywhere. So if you knew my IP address and if this port was not firewalled on my um, uh, on my home network, you would be able just to connect to my to, to that port and to that server. Uh, we can use different tools to connect to the to the TCP IP ports. Uh, one of the tools we can use is Telnet. Uh, we don't have a client uh, part of the client server code here, but because it's based on text and because of the input output, um, like standard input output, we can yeah, effectively use Telnet or Netcat or some other uh, mechanisms that you can type standard input output through a socket connection. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna connect to port 6666 using Telnet. And then at that point, the server has a, a first connection coming in and we can check it out in the code. So let me, <clears throat> let me open it. I've noticed that the fonts on the, um, on the, IntelliJ a, a little bit on the small side. I mean, they are visible in high resolution, but let me, um, yeah, let me make them bigger. So font, no, what we could do, maybe 18. Yeah, that looks better. Yeah, maybe even 19. Right, so we will have a little bit bigger code. So what happens is the, um, find it, the uh, structure. So we, when we open the, um, the socket for incoming connections, um, the, the socket has, uh, in C it's, it's the same, there is a accept method. So you open the, the socket and then you have sort of a, a blocking method which expects somebody to connect. And that method typically is called accept. 
Um, so in, at that point, we're blocking the server and we're waiting for incoming connection. When the connection comes, we have the, the handle to the connection and potential errors, and then we loop back. So we kind of have this in a loop and we wait for another connection so such that we can handle multiple clients. And then what we do with the connection is we pass it to, a, we have a concept of a chat room and we um, you know, push the connection through the, the channel such that the, anybody who is listening for new connection can, can handle it. And the chat room has a, a channel joins and then we just pushing that new connection into the, the channel. So this is the main loop, which I just executed here, right? So if, the, if I do it from another client, so if I do another telnet, local host, uh, let me make it bigger. No, it's 6666. Then um, I'm connected, right? So I, I've run this loop twice and I pushed two connections in here. And then what happens is I have a very simple uh, kind of a hello handler, which lets users to introduce themselves. Otherwise they are without any name because I didn't send anything to the server yet and the server didn't send anything to me. We just established a, a connection, a, a pipe. So there is a command if I say user and then I specify uh, some sort of username, I can say Adam, then the server will receive that text and will remember that this particular connection is called Adam. Uh, and this is happening in, um, this is happening in, that's the, yeah, so what we need to do is we need to read, um, this is the client reading the connection and we have the broadcast, we have the joins and then when the, uh, let me find this, where do we do that? Yeah, so we're doing here. So um, the the join handles um, uh, connections which were have been open with the chat room. So the the join connection means I have new connection and it's uh, attached to the chat room, and then I have a concurrent go routine here, which is you know uh, anonymous and no param no parameters and it continuously fetches incoming data from that particular connection. So this is like the, the listener, which listens for all the traffic that goes from that particular connection. And when it happens, and it happens again through the, through the channel, it checks if the, so it, it, uh, for the check, it makes everything lowercase and it checks if my data starts with, um, you know, hash user. And if it does, it splits the text, it splits this line into individual uh, items. And then it, it ignores the first one and takes the second one. So it checks if I have at least two items and then it takes the second one and assigns it to, <clears throat> to the client name. So I'm representing on the server side, I'm representing all those connections as clients. And then the client is, um, the client is represented as uh, a name, incoming and outgoing channels, and then incoming and outgoing buffers for the socket. So from, from the socket side, I have those two in and out. So this is for the text coming in and coming out. And this connects the client with the socket. And those two connects the client with the chat room. So the chat room can read um, stuff from the incoming and push stuff into outgoing con um, channels such that I have the chat room, the client and uh, the socket, which is the actual IO, right? So this is a very simple uh, mechanism and I have a name which depicts 
uh, kind of a named connection such that I can like whoever, uh, when server gets the, the information from that particular connection, it will know from where it, it received it. So, so far it, it looks quite good. And then uh, I have a very uh, uh, easy uh, implementation for writing and reading. So uh, reading is kind of a continuous loop to read from the socket. So from the, from the reader, I'm just reading uh, line by line and then pushing it into the into the incoming channel, right? So this is a, a, a loop which reads from the incoming socket and pushes it into the channel. And then the reverse is right, which checks if I have something in the outgoing uh, channel and then it writes it into the, into the socket. Um, you will notice that in here, I'm not using the normal, so here for reading from the, from the client outgoing. So normally I would have a loop which says client, client outgoing and I would be reading, I would be reading from, um, from the channel, right? So I would have kind of a line, for example, and I would say line equals to the next value read from the, um, from the channel. <clears throat> so what, what is the difference? between, so I have now kind of two versions of the loop. I have four, let's say forever, read from the channel and then uh, send it like I would repeat those two lines here, uh, send it to the, to the socket. So I will have the same here. Um, <clears throat> and I would have some, I would need some sort of condition for breaking up this forever loop, right? So at some point, I have to tear down everything. So how would I know when things should finish? I could have some sort of a com com command which the uh, chat room sends me saying, well, uh, we're wrapping up, you, you know, uh, close the connection and we, we're closing. So then I would have to in interpret somehow here, I would have something like if strings, um, contains or index of, or, you know, some, some sort of mechanism, let's say we're using index of, uh, <clears throat> and then I would have to say, okay, is maybe there is a command quit or something like this. If, you know, if the, uh, not S uh, line, if the line starts with quit, that means, okay, that's not really a data. I'm not supposed to write it to the socket. We're wrapping up and I should break this loop, right? So that would be a little bit hard. So the easier mechanism, if you want to have something going on forever, but having a mechanism to close it and to quit it is to use the range. So range, you remember range from the normal um, slices or uh, arrays iterating over um, a slice. So a range in connection with a channel is basically the same. It will read item by item until there is a close. So if the server, uh, if, the, if my chat room at some point uh, says um, client outgoing close, right? Then this, um, this channel is gonna get closed and then I will quit this forever range loop. So closing a channel is possible. We normally don't have to do it, but if you do that, that will signal uh, to whoever is reading from the channel that the channel is not more, it's not any more available. And then this range loop will basically stop. So the moment that channel is closed, uh, this range loop will stop and I will hit the, the closing bracket. So there is an, uh, an equivalent test for testing if the channel was closed. So what you can do is normally you say, I have some, uh, I have some, uh, work, I have some value that I'm reading from a channel, right? So I, I can have um, a code like this, which reads a value from the channel, but if the channel is closed and if, if I don't have an, any value in the channel, it will block. If I have a value, it will, you know, assign and, and continue. <clears throat> but if the channel has been closed or if I'm blocking here and the channel gets closed, I can have okay. Uh, and then, okay, signals to me 
if the channel is still open, <clears throat> sorry, or if I have a channel that has been closed and I, you know, have to deal with it. So this is um, a, an additional mechanism for dealing with synchronization about the channels and we do nicely use it here. So uh, in that respect, that code is okay. We, we can leave it, right? So let's continue with our, uh, with our demo. So I will do the same. So let's, let's now, Adam has introduced himself to the server, but this, um, you know, this guy didn't. So if I type something here, um, let's make it even a little bit bigger. So if, if uh, Adam says, hello, um, Adam, then the server makes kind of a, a, um, an echo into the, uh, the screen, but you know, whatever you type here doesn't matter. Like it's, it's not really even reading stuff from the standard input, uh, but it echoing what is happening here. And then because Adam introduced, uh, himself or herself, then it is kind of known. So the, there is a, uh, the prefix which says who that person is. If I say hello here, um, you see there is a, um, <clears throat> standard input, which I, I, I wrote, that went to the server. The server doesn't know who that person is. So there is a empty uh, space uh, or an empty string. And then there is a echo again from, from that person. And what the server does, it broadcasts the, <clears throat> it broadcasts the message to everybody listening on the, uh, on the connections. You will notice that there is no echo here. There is some issues already. You, you can realize that, well, why, uh, why Adams? Um, so if I say again, hello here, um, this kind of works, this doesn't work. Um, <clears throat> so let's introduce ourselves. So let's say user, I am uh, Charlie. Okay, and hello from Charlie. All right, so now I have Charlie and Adam kind of introduced. I have a prefix which says, okay, Charlie is talking. And then, hey, Charlie. Okay, so now it works, right? So we see that we have some sort of condition which says if this guy introduced it, himself or herself to the server, then it works. If they didn't, then something is not quite right. And then you will also notice that when the broadcast happens, so like, um, if there, is, if there is a message, right? So there is a message from Adam and this message is broadcasted to everybody who uh, listens for messages. Well, not really because that message is not kind of, uh, not displayed by, the, by, the, by this client, right? So somehow the server filters out the message which is from Adam and doesn't pushes it back to Adam. It only pushes it back to everybody else. So let's check how this is done. Uh, and this is done by <clears throat> another uh, go routine, which um, reads from the, yeah. So we, we have kind of a chat room listen call and that starts another go routine which iterates over uh, incoming messages. So what is incoming into the, uh, into the chat room and then it broadcasts it to everybody. So let's check the broadcast method. So the broadcast method says, okay, we continuously again, we're using the range idea. We, we reading continuously, uh, no, no, actually clients is, yeah, that's another thing. So it iterates over all the clients. The clients is a slice of pointers to clients. Uh, and then it checks if the data that we supposed to push starts with the name of the client. If it starts, it doesn't do that, right? So it says, if it doesn't start with the client name, then we push the data out to that particular client. But if the data is from that client, we don't do that. So there is no echo back to Adam, right? So this is, this is okay as well. Um, you will notice that uh, the clients, uh, in, um, so where is that? Yeah, so the, the clients is the slice of pointers to client type uh, inside the room. Um, and 
there is a small problem with it. Okay, so it works, uh, but the problem is what if we want to remove a client from a slice? So if, for, for example, if I, um, if I do that, I quit one of the, uh, I, I, I quit Charlie, right? So Ch Charlie is gone. Uh, and, you know, we, we have a, a, an issue. Uh, we have uh, kind of a server going berserk because the server is going in a loop and there is an error because Charlie closed the socket and then we have kind of a serious bug. We almost have a denial of service, right? And Adam is saying, oh, what the hell, right? What just happened? Um, so we have to kill the server and we have to fix that. So we have to fix that by handing errors. And that's the second big point of today code review. Uh, so you will notice that when when the client reads the string from a, from a socket. So here is a connection, um, a client connection, which has two open uh, reader and writer from the socket. And at some point that socket got closed uh, and I just killed the socket by, you know, by killing Charlie. And when that happened, there was, there will be an error. And what I do, I kind of say, yeah, I don't care about errors. It will work, right? And it sort of worked until Charlie died. And when Charlie died, it stopped working. So doing that for errors is a big no-no. Like you normally should never do that. Uh, if you don't do that, um, then usually you will avoid having issues. And then when you don't do that, it will also force you to think what happens with the edge cases? So what happens here with the edge case? Well, you know, the client, something is wrong with the socket on, on the client side, which means um, we have to deal with it and probably we have to remove the client from the chat room, right? So here we have to deal with the error and not by printing an error to the server console saying, oh, there was an error, everything is fine. We actually have to remove the client from the client list. And to remove the client from the client list, we have to remove them from, this, from that slice. And the problem with removing something from an array or something from a slice is that you have to iterate over the array and find out which index that thing is and then remove it, right? Um, Golang is quite cheeky uh, with this uh, because in some programming languages, um, so let's say I want to have a function. So I need a function on our chat room, uh, which removes a client, right? So in our chat room, I have to have a remove client and it will take, it will take C, which is our client and it will magically remove it from clients, right? So the task, is to remove C from clients, right? Uh, let's, uh, that would be very nice name, but I am uh, remove C from our clients. So how can we do that? How can we remove C from that slice? In some programming languages, you do have a concept of saying uh, our clients find find index, you know, and then you put a value. So you say C, right? And then, or index of. In Java, you, there is a, a method called index of, right? And you can say, okay, what's index of C? If index of C is minus one, that means it doesn't exist here. If index of it is bigger than minus one. So if index of bigger than minus one or Beagle equals zero. That means, okay, that item exists in that slice. And then we just do our clients uh, delete or in, in Go, you know, it's called delete. And then you put clients and say the index, right? So you have to then copy that. So I uh, clients index off. C, right? So that would be the code that you would write. But Golang says, 
That's stupid. I mean, you know, you, you have a data structure that you want to remove something and that is, you know, O of N operation. So you should kind of not do that. Like why you design your data structure for your removals to be O of N complexity, right? Uh, that's just stupid. You have you should use something that is O of one, right? Every time you need to remove something, it should be kind of fast. So how can we modify it such that it would be O of one? Well, in Golang again, Golang is a simple language. You know, simple solutions to simple problems. So this, first of all, there is no method to find an index of something in the slice because the designer said say. say you know, you should never do that. Like uh, if you're doing that, if you need to do that, you do you did something wrong earlier. Uh, you should not design your code in such a way that you need to find an index of something in a slice because if you need to do that, you should use a different data structure, right? So what is a different data structure that we could use to have O of one for representing our, our clients? So that, that's question to you, uh, Zoom chat people. So what can we use? What sort of data structure could we use to have an ability to remove something in just O of one complexity instead of searching for it where it is? Exactly, perfect. So the suggestion from UF is we just use a map, right? So if we convert it to a map, um, the question now is we have a client and how we should map what to what. So it would be nice if all the clients have name and if the name was unique, because then we could map name uh, to the instance of a client and always find them by name. That's not true in our case because we don't know, um, you know, we don't know all the names of, 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 of everybody. So what, what that map should be? Well, you know, it would have to be the client itself to be the, our key because that's the only unique thing that we know about the, the clients. Um, we actually have the instance, the name is not unique, and then there is nothing else that we can sort of extract in a primitive type that, that is, um, we could use an IP address, that's correct. So we could extract an IP address from the connection and uh, store it here. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a valid point. So Dennis suggests that we could use something unique about the connection, like for example, an IP address. But then, you know, I co actually connected those two clients from my home machine, which all share the same IP address. So it would have to be an IP address together with a particular port on which they initiated the connection, right? Uh, because the server is listening on port 6666, it's the same port, but the port which this client connects to has kind of a unique number which is generated by the operating system and that's quite unique. So if we uh, combined an IP address with the port that could work. I just wanted to show you another idiomatic way of, uh, of doing that and it's a concept of a set. So you can use map uh, to emulate sets, even if your language doesn't have sets. Uh, sets are quite uh, nice beasts because a set is a concept where you can put stuff into, and then you have O1 complexity of finding them, whether they are in the set or not, and O1 complexity of removing stuff from the set. So some languages have set built-in and they use kind of a hash map behind the scene such that you don't see it. Uh, some languages don't really have sets, like in Golang, you kind of don't, you know, you, you can have a library which, you know, mocks sets for you, uh, but you only have maps. So to, to represent a set in a Golang, what would you do is you would say, I have some items, in our case, the, the clients, and they map to bool, right? So then it's quite nice because if I do a test of existence. So if I say clients um, do my um, do my R clients have uh, 
do my our clients have uh, C, then I will get a value. So value is if I have it or not. And then of course there is an okay, which I could use. Um, but because the default value for non-existing client in the set is false, I actually have the same behavior just with V, right? So I can always say if um, R of clients of C exists, then do something or you know remove it or whatever. And that's O of one, right? So this is kind of a neat trick for simulate sets in, in Golang. And that's what we should use here. So instead of using a slice, which has this kind of O of N complexity to deal with uh, deletions and finding if something is here, uh, we can use the concept of a set and then we have this uh, o, of, o of one. So that's great. So um, we kind of ranted a little bit about why there is no index of, and instead we can use a set. And then if we do a set, we have this, which makes it quite a nice, um, Nice piece of code. And I hope I got the, so this is fine. That complains that, yeah, I don't know what that complaint is about. This is fine. This is wrong. And then is it, uh, let's check. So where is the, so if we go, go link doc and we check um, source search map. Yeah, that's not that useful map. Uh, okay, so let's search for delete. Built in delete. So we have to specify the separately the map and then the key. So the syntax I got wrong. Uh, you do the map and then the key. All right. So then we have uh, an ability to remove the a particular client from the chat room. Um, yeah, let's rename it to chat room. I don't know why it complains about the about the inconsistency probably of the naming. Yeah, so this is all nice. We have now a lot of errors and we have to fix them. So I will I will do that later. I mean, we don't have to um, fix all the code. I just need to tell you the, the concept. So the first concept was here uh, to change the slice into the set. And then we have an a, a easy ability to remove um, to remove the clients from the from the set. The second one is we have to have this mechanism for uh, deleting the we have to have a mechanism for deleting the client from the from the chat room. Uh, there is also another um, another problem, and as you see, those two methods are highlighted, right? So you already learned the lesson here that you should handle errors, and it's the same here. So on the writing part, I can also have a problem when I'm trying to write and the the uh, receiving connection is closed then this one will, will um, return an error, right? So um, both this writing to the, to the channel and, and forcing the write uh, will cause, will potentially cause an error. So here I also have to check, uh, check the error and check the error and I have to handle it. 
Um, so if, well, um, do I need to handle the first error separate from the second one? Well, if, if this one had an error, then I'm not supposed to be flashing because I know it will also cause an error, but I kind of don't care uh, who failed. I just need to know that I have some problem. So what I can do is I can sort of um, do a little bit untidy uh, mechanism if I say if error one or um, where is or um, or error two is different than nil, right? So if one of them failed, then I need to deal with it, uh, but um, I don't need to know which one which one failed. Uh, why are you don't like that? Ah, yeah, because this one doesn't return the error. It returns a number of, um, it returns, uh, yeah, so I am ignoring the value and the error. So it returns two things, how much stuff has been written uh, to the to the reader, uh, to the writer, and if there was an error. So I, I have to ignore the first one. Otherwise, you know, it always, if I only use one, it thinks it's the first one. All right, and then I need to kind of handle it. So here we have to do the same code that we do here. Uh, so somehow on the, um, in, when the, uh, when this call happens, I have to have a handle to the chat room such that I can tell the chat room to remove that particular client from the, uh, from the, struct. I can do it two ways. So one way is I pass, uh, I have kind of a circular reference, re reference such that the chat room has all the clients, but when the clients are instantiated, it kind of injects itself into the client such that the clients also have a, uh, the client has a reference to the chat room it belongs to, right? So I could have clients containing, uh, chat room containing clients and client having a reference back to the to the chat room, uh, and that's fine. Uh, we could extend it by adding, you know, adding a new uh, the the reference to uh, to a room, uh, and then when I'm instantiating the client, I, I say, okay, you belong to this room, and then if I do that, then uh, the handling of the error is relatively straightforward. I can say if error is different than nil, then our how we call it, remove uh, room, room and client. So client room, remove client, right? So I can say, well, you know, I'm sort of done here. I got an error. We will not be serving you any more lines. So I, I am kind of putting myself for deletion and I will break the loop. Uh, such that I kind of return from here. So I'm not, I'm not even, um, you, you can, uh, instead of break, you can kind of say return. So you, you're gonna close the, uh, this, uh, this loop completely, right? Because I'm not gonna write anything to the, to the incoming uh, pipe, to the communication from me to the, um, to the chat room. But now if, if we do this this way, you see, uh, because I have the, direct communication with the room, I have a reference here, then this mechanism is a little bit weird because why would I do that instead of calling, you know, something on the room to tell the room that there is this, um, this line, right? And the room can handle it itself. So because we have this mechanism, maybe we, instead of doing this reference here, we could have this uh, mechanism of checking uh, when the, when the room reads, um, so when the room does this, right? Um, or actually when the room does this. So when the room does this, 
we could have a kind of a command processor and it would say, okay, if I have an incoming request for removal from the chat room from that client, I will kind of remove it. So it, either way, you, you have to decide on one mechanism and sort of stick to it. Otherwise it might be a little bit confusing, although you could use those two mechanisms, one for removal for this kind of maintenance and one for just passing the, uh, the messages. Why? Uh, because you could imagine that you want to have some middleware and for removal, you, you do want to have this direct communication with the chat room. But for example, you want to have a middleware which adds additional logging or you want some audit trace and you want to log some, uh, you know, what was the communication flow. And then having everything done through the channel is kind of nicer because you can, um, you can inject things in, in the middle, right? So uh, let me show you. Um, let me show you here. So currently we have one channel. Um, we have a channel and it, it is uh, written to by clients and then it is um, read from by uh, the room, right? So room reads, reads from a channel and clients uh, push into it, right? Uh, I don't have a direct, so with the other model, what would happen is I would have a room and room is kind of connected to clients. Uh, let's say it's just a single client, right? Uh, and then because I have a, a coupling, I will have hard time injecting something in the middle because client depends on the room and room has a client, right? So uh, from the client point of view, when the client sends a message, the client is directly coupled with the room, right? Uh, here, I have this middle thing in the middle, which decouples my uh, my connectivity, like client doesn't know who reads from that channel. For From the client point of view, it can be anybody. In this model, from the client point of view, it has to be a room, right? So in this model, if I want to in inject something in the middle, I can say, okay, I have uh, a lock channel uh, and then I have the original channel and I have a client, right? Uh, and then from the client point of view, nothing changes. And then from the room point of view, I kind of injected, injected additional channel that actually reads from this channel, uh, does something to it, like the, the middleware processing, like logs it or add some you know, lowercase, whatever you want to do in the middle, and then gives it back to the room and then room handles it. Right, so it's kind of easy to do that this way because I kind of inject something in the middle and I only need to modify slightly from where the, uh, the room gets or how the, the channels are kind of handled. With this model, I need to modify both ends and injecting something is not as dynamic. I can have this pipeline organized in such a way that I can have the middleware being dynamic such that I can always inject new channel in the middle and the new channel will read and put into the existing channels. You, you get the idea? So I, you know, if, if you have channels, it's quite easy uh, to, so if I have one channel and somebody writes to it and somebody reads to it, I can kind of um, make uh, chains of connectivity between other channels such that um, I, I have a piece of logic which kind of works like this and allows you to inject new channel in the middle such that you can get uh, different patterns. So if you watch the, uh, the concurrent programming talk, you kind of, um, they, they talked about patterns like you have a channel which writes to another channel, uh, channel B, and then you can have channel C and channel A and channel C can also write to channel B. And then uh, you have just a single, uh, like a funnel, right? Uh, or you can kind of uh, split it, right? So I can have the opposite. I can have channel uh, B, channel B writing to channel A and um, to channel C, like I'm uh, making a copy. So this, there is some logic which pu puts the same thing into two channels and so on. You can kind of uh, play with it. You can organize various ways of uh, organizing your flow and organizing your connectivity and it's very dynamic. So it decouples your components in such a way that you have this flexibility, right? So um, so that's what I think is okay in, in this case that we will have a dependency uh, on the room 
from the maintenance point of view, from uh, just wiring the, the components in. Uh, but for the communication, I, I want to have this flexibility because I may want to introduce you know, uh, some checks or introduce some additional processing to the information being passed through the, uh, the chat room. So uh, I think it's okay to stick to, the, um, to this model for messaging and to have this model for you know uh, handling of the removal and it's the same here so I would need to add um, I will need to say client room remove client and then we pass ourselves in right so then I have um, I handle the errors and then if I kill uh, Charlie then the server will just remove that client from the uh, from the set of clients and everything will continue to work quite nicely right I, I need to of course tidy up the code because uh, we changed those two methods but we need to now uh, introduce room in here and we have to kind of tidy it up I, I'm not gonna do that I will do that after the class and push the changes to the uh, to the repo but I think you 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 got the idea of what initially was kind of wrong here and how you can improve your, your design. So the first thing that was really wrong here was not handling errors. Uh, I cannot stress it enough. It's so tempting to always um, ignore your errors in Golang because they are kind of nuisance. Um, if you are doing the advanced programming and you move to Rust, you will love the way Rust handles this type of errors. In Golang, unfortunately, you have to do those uh, tedious if statements everywhere, uh, but you just have to do them, right? So you do, you know, you do not use the underscore, you do use the error and you do those if statements. Uh, th that, that will save you a lot of uh, problems, especially if you have a relatively complex problem, like uh, th this is not very complex problem uh, uh, system, but you know, this killing the Charlie and having this was a little bit surprising. Like, uh, what the hell? Like, how it, this happened, right? Uh, well, it happened because you have loops and they ignore errors and they keep looping, right? So um, don't do that. The other problem is um, slices are great, but sometimes a map or a set is a much better idea. So uh, you may be tempted to use slices sort of everywhere, uh, which is fine, but consider every time that you need this index off and you, it's like a you know alarm bell telling you you're doing something wrong. You're not supposed to use array or slice here. You're supposed to use something else. In Java, I use index of a lot. Like I remember in my kind of assignment days, um, we had a lot of code which did index off and the design of Go is good because the lack of index off is a constant reminder that you're doing something wrong if you do need index off, right? Uh, sure, there might be some cases where you really need index off in exceptional situation. Like you normally don't do this linear search through your data structure, but in some exceptional situations, you may need to have a slice uh, because for whatever reasons, and then you have, um, you know, this kind of a linear search for something specific. Um, I, I don't, I don't know, but you know, j just judge your cases. If, if it, that's your case, yeah, sure. You, you're probably doing it okay. But uh, most of the time I know from my experience that I was doing it wrong and Go kind of taught me uh, that index of is kind of bad uh, and they don't have it in the API at all, right? Um, so that's the, the way how it looks. Yeah, so Suzanne asks if I can add more comments uh, when I uh, upgrade the, the code and fix things. Yes, I will. Um, there is one, another small thing here. So you will notice that I have, um, yeah, if, if we go to the package, uh, we have two packages. We have the main, which has a server. The client is not implemented. It's kind of left for keen people to, to do the client if, if you want to. Uh, and you can push merge request. And then I have the uh, all the logic in the main folder and the, the main logic is in the chat package. And then of course, because you have two packages, you have to make certain things visible and cer certain things hidden. And you've noticed that I've used 
kind of uh, hidden everything. <laughs> so all those names are small cases. Uh, it's not almost nothing is visible. Uh, and then if you go to the server, you will notice that um, we have a new new chat room uh, is a, a method which is publicly visible to other packages. Uh, and then there is a method called run. Uh, let's go to utils again and structure and check who what is capitalized. So you see that there is a run and new chat room. Those are the only two publicly visible things outside of the chat package. You don't see anything else. Um, it is a good idea to have um, your logic in a different package than main, to have your main function in main package. And then when you're writing your, your main function, when you write it, you will know what you need uh, in here. And then you, it, it's a good idea to keep it minimum such that you only put uh, capital letters to the stuff that you really need in, the, in, the, in, in, the, in a different package, right? Uh, I'm not manipulating clients here. I'm not doing anything with the clients. I only create a new chat room and I just run it. And um, that's all I need from here. So that's why the design is very minimalistic. And that's why in utils, we only have two things which are publicly exposed outside of the package. Uh, you may have a tendency to make everything capital letters. That's a bad, uh, bad strategy. Like start with hiding everything, encapsulating everything into the package, and then um, only exposing things that you really need to expose because they are useful or they are used from, from your main package or from other packages. Uh, because that will make your kind of encapsulation and your um, hiding of, of stuff a, a little bit better. Um, Having said that, that will bite your ass if you're doing JSON, because for parsing JSON, a parsing package needs to have access to all your structs. So even if you, 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 know, you don't really want anybody else to be fiddling with your structs, like if, even if I didn't have uh, anything here to do with JSON, but I did use JSON for the communication between the clients, I have to make those structs which are encoded into JSON public and they have to have capital letters. So remember that, that everything in JSON has to be capitalized. Otherwise the built-in parser will not be able to, to understand it because your structs will not be visible to the parser library, which live in another package. Um, other than that, I kind of recommend you hiding everything first and then only opening up, um, yeah. So only opening up the methods that you really need to expose and the structs and types that you really need to, to be exposed. And that will keep, keep it tidy. And you will get compiler error if you're not exposing something that your um, client code or a main package code requires because you know the compiler will not be able to link it. So that's, uh, that's another takeaway here. All right, so do you have any, any questions about this uh, chat, chat server? Of course, I, I am not too happy with this, uh, like with this uh, matching of the words and these commands, you know, hard-coded strings. Uh, that's a kind of a bad, bad design. It, it's such a simple functionality that making more complex machinery here for detecting the commands would be an overkill. But I already know that I kind of don't like it. So if I had one or two more commands that I want the clients to be able to issue, I probably would refactor this to have some sort of um, mechanism to deal with the uh, handling of the commands differently, not kind of hard-coded way like this. I would probably use some more type um, checking and some uh, uh, structured way of processing the different commands in a kind of a functional way that I would have functions to deal with certain commands. But yeah, for this demonstration and because I only have one command and it's kind of only, yeah, so, you know, it's so simple that it would be an overkill to make that more complicated. Another thing that I um, often did in Golang, which is not that great, is you could, um, so, you know, you, you have, um, so when you have the command, you have some sort of, a, uh, yeah, in our case, it's a user, 
yeah, let me clear that. So a command looks like I have a token, which is a user space, and then I have something else like Adam, right? Um, so this is the string that you're gonna get uh, in data. So data is, is kind of this, this string. Um, and then there are different ways of uh, processing it. And what I did in the past was I usually had co code written like this. I had strings uh, and then I say split. And then what you take, because I, I kind of came from Java and Java had this kind of a split method. Um, so you, you pass a string and you pass the separator of what you want to separate it and it returns you an array of strings, right? So that would work. So if I do split data and I say separate by space, um, that code would be exactly the same as this one because given that string, it would give me uh, this item and this item. The problem is that if I uh, introduce additional space here, then those two codes are not the same anymore. Uh, fields handles the, uh, the space nicely and it will give me user uh, dash uh, hash user and Adam, but split will give me, you know, user space, empty string space, Adam, right? So I will have three tokens and I will have to deal with those empty strings because in between spaces, there is something, but it's like nothing, right? So split is not as robust and as easy to deal as fields. And I kind of um, uh, made the mistake before of, uh, whoops, uh, of using split instead of fields. So you, you need to work out what do you really need to do. Uh, sometimes, for example, if we have a URLs, like, you know, uh, students um, three name, like something like this, uh, then you cannot use fields because it's just one string. There is no spaces. There is no white space anywhere in between. So you have to use split and you split it by, by dashes. And then when you split it by dashes, you're gonna get one, two, three items, and then you can kind of deal with it nicely. So split, of course, has its use. Um, and the bottom line here is read the docs. So if you go to the strings, um, so if you go to strings uh, package, so let's go strings packages, strings. And then you have all those methods explained here and you have explanation of what split does and then what, um, what fields does and fields splits the string around each instance of uh, one or more consecutive white space characters, right? Uh, so it kind of handles the, yeah, the, the, the spaces much nicer. Uh, and you, you just check if you need to do something with strings, well, just, just check what's available to you. What are the um, available methods such that you know what standard library allows you to do, uh, and then you have um, an easier, easier mechanisms. So of course there is me uh, methods to make things lowercase and uppercase, uh, so to lower and, and to upper, but there is, for example, a, a title one, which uh, makes things um, uh, highlighted, uh, the first characters, such that you don't need to do it programmatically. It is kind of done for you by this method. Uh, so certain things, certain things that other languages may not have, and you have to program it, uh, are kind of built in. And, and, and title is one of those, uh, you know, neat tricks that you can do. So if you, yeah, so if we run it, you will notice that it will kind of make, it will, um, yeah, make uppercase from the first characters of the of the sequences and it deals of course really well with the uh, UTF uh, unicodes right so uh, handle errors read the docs uh, use the channels range for um, reading from um, yeah from the from the channels yeah about that uh, when we killing ourselves here, so we, where, where are we killing ourselves? So the client, um, yeah, the client is kind of a killing itself here. 
uh, then there is a, a question of um, who kills the channel. Like, so who kills the client incoming channel, right? Um, one way is that the client kind of kills the channel because client owns the channel. Or the other one is you do that inside a remove client method and it's the um, room responsibility to kind of clean everything related to the, um, to the channel. So in our case, if we go to um, new chat room and if, if we go to the new chat room and you, you see it's the, it's the room which makes the channels. Right? So if the room makes the channels, it is more consistent in our design currently for the room to kill the channels, to say a channel close, right? Um, even more consistent would be for the client um, to only have, so if we have the, uh, the client and the client has the incoming and outgoing channel, it would be more consistent to say, okay, client, uh, that's the room, sorry. Um, yeah, for the client uh, struct here uh, would be to say incoming channel from the client point of view is only to read from, right? We restrict clients not to be able to write to incoming channels and outgoing channel is restricted to being written to. Uh, and then you cannot fiddle with the channels like channels are managed by the room and you don't kind of have the full control here. And that would be a clear indication who is responsible for closing the channel, right? Um, yeah, it's actually the other way around. So the outgoing is, it's the outgoing is seen from the point of the socket, right? So incoming is, uh, I, I have something incoming from the socket so I can put it into the incoming and outgoing is something I have to push out. Yeah, so then, if we change this, we signal, okay, room is responsible. And then uh, in, remove, um, in remove client, we will kind of delete the chat room client, but we will also, um, uh, before, uh, yeah, we can, we can, because we have a handle there, we can also do, that, that channel actually is, um, we don't need to kill the channel because the channel is shared between multiple clients. So the channel um, is not per, let me quickly check. I have the room and I have the client and then the new client. Yes, so the, there are two incoming and outgoing channels sets. So there is one joined one, which is for all the clients, which is for broadcast and for incoming in the room. And there is a, a set of channels per client. And then the client is responsible for making them. So in that case, uh, this um, incoming and outgoing channel that we're going to close should be done in the client code. So when we when we're killing ourselves here, we should, uh, before we remove ourselves from the, uh, from the room, what we should do is we should say client um, <coughs> incoming close. And we should say um, the same for the, yeah, for the other one. I will check that out. I don't want to confuse you more. Uh, I think it would it, it should be on the client side, but I will put the, the, the comments. All right, uh, let's move on. So we will close this, this project. Um, let's close this one and let's open the student rest one. We have <clears throat> uh, 20 minutes left. So let's do this one. So this one is organized into um, data structures around our data store. Uh, and most of it is publicly visible because we want the, um, we want the logic for the database be in a kind of a separate package and that being used by the logic which has to do with uh, our networking, with our REST communication. So in this case, 
a design which exposes quite a lot is probably justified. But again, you, you may need to check what exactly needs to be exposed and what doesn't. So if you hide everything, then the compiler complains that you need something, but you don't expose it. But if you open everything, then you don't know if it needs to be open or not. So as I said, it, it's usually better to start with a uh, more conservative um, exposure of the API uh, instead of opening everything uh, up. But this, this is relatively straightforward. We have students uh, represented as, as maps, okay, ticked. We don't have ON search for removal. Uh, we have O1 uh, for removal and uh, uh, finding it. So for lookup. So, you know, um, when we need to get a particular student, we get it with O1 complexity. So that's fine. Uh, we can pre prepare all the students as a slice such that it's easy to do kind of uh, range operations and things on the slice. So we have kind of an, an utility method which returns all the students as a, as a student slice such that we can kind of easily, easily do that. Um, you will notice that I'm not returning uh, a, a reference to all the students, right? So I'm not returning this, I'm returning this. Um, so again, it's a little bit of a design decision. W would you want to have a slice of students to be doing some manipulation on them? Or will you want them only for read only? And then you will not be kind of updating or changing it. Um, it, it is important because if you have a multi-threaded uh, environment and if you have a multi-go routine environment and you are doing some manipulations on the student instances from multiple threads, of course you need to synchronize it. So then you need to use channels or you need to use some, some mechanisms for ensuring that that's the case. So it is safer not to say star here, it's safer just to say this, because then I can, um, I, I know that I'm not like uh, fiddling with the data, I'm, I'm just giving you the copy and you can kind of see the properties, you can display it or you can do some, some stuff with it. Uh, you can turn it into JSON and send it to the, uh, to the web client, but you are not gonna change something beneath my feet. Right? So every time you're returning kind of a reference to something, well, you, you need to be kind of um, um, careful of, of what, what you want. And the way we, we manage that is we have this uh, student DB and that's what we do our manipulations on students, right? So we adding students, we counting them, removing them. We don't have an update method, right? So if you see this uh, student storage interface, we don't have an ability to update a student, right? We not uh, currently have this ability, but if we did, it would be on that level, not on like the pointer to student level, right? So you, you kind of keep it hidden and you keep it behind the interface of how you're updating a particular student record and you don't expose in your API a reference to a student and then some code somewhere will kind of uh, change it. So it is, um, it's, it is a kind of a safer design. So one, uh, one note here is that we don't have update yet implemented, but that's okay. Uh, and then we do not expose students via the pointer, same with get. So get doesn't re uh, return a student via pointer neither. So it's a good design, okay? So this, so far so good. So this check of the data structures, uh, the sanity check, suggests that we kind of doing things correctly. Uh, so let's then check the API. And then the API has, uh, let me do structure. So I have um, two hidden methods, uh, reply with all students and reply with a student. And then I have one public one, which is called handler student. So let's check with the handler student first and already uh, by, by, by seeing that you see the method is quite long. Uh, so it starts here, it goes on uh, and it doesn't fit with the large font on a single screen. It, it fits on a single screen with a smaller font, but um, generally you should try to keep your methods relatively small 
uh, because it's easier for somebody doing kind of a code review or, or trying to understand what you're doing uh, more, more concise. I, I mean, I am not uh, orthodox about that rule. Like there is a movement which says, keep your methods small or keep your functions short is actually harmful. And it sometimes reduces the readability. Sometimes it's okay to have things in a scope and have some inner functions inside a function and make the, the actual function a little bit longer, but have it kind of encapsulated and having everything in kind of logically in one scope. Um, so, you know, don't be religious about the length of the methods, but if the method is long, maybe there is something fishy, right? And in our case, it is. So we see that we have a handler student method, which handles two cases. It cases for the post and it handles the case for the get, right? Why a single method handles both cases? Um, yeah, that's a little bit untidy. Uh, so what would be tidier would be to have a method which dispatches, which kind of uh, checks what are we, what we need to deal with, uh, and then dispatches the the handling to two other methods, right? Uh, such that we have the post and the get handled by separate methods instead of this sort of a code inside here. So one refactoring that we could do is we could take, like we could check, okay, uh, we could dispatch on the on the request method, and if the method is post, we have just one one function which does this. And then if the method is get, we have the other function which does this. And then this, this function would be very compact and it would be very clear to see what's going on. Currently, I mean, it is the same logic, but it's a little bit not that straightforward to see that that's what is happening, right? So if I convert this into a method and this into a method, then this will work like a sim single dispatch. And then it will be a little bit clearer of what is happening. So that's uh, one uh, recommendation that I will do again after the class. The other recommendation is let's check those two methods. So I have um, I have a global DB inside my package, right? So I have a REST student package uh, and then let's see the project again. Uh, and I have a command which has a server, which has a main function, right? So the, the main function is here. Uh, it calls um, initialization on the database, uh, but in my package, uh, so in here, I have kind of a package global variable, which says I have this DB here. Uh, so what, what what's going on here? Let's ask uh, what is, where do I use it? So I kind of use it, um, I use it in those reply methods. So I pass this global handler to those methods uh, from within my handler student method. And the handler student method is a public one and it is being used in the um, in the main to initiate like how the handling is done. And you see, I have a problem because I have to pass, I have to pass like, you know, normally what should happen is I should have some code which initializes my database. So db init should be here and I should be able to get kind of a DB handle, right? So the DB, the DB should be here, right? I, I have, I initialize my database and I have the handle to the DB and I should be able to pass this DB somehow to this handler because the handler is doing something with DB and uh, it's doing it via this global variable, right? Instead of via the, the thing that is here passed into this method, right? So it's a kind of a, a very typical design. A lot of you would like to do that. You not, you should not do that, right? So what you should do is you should have, um, you should have a different design. So what you should do is you should say, I take my DB here. 
So uh, what, whatever the, the type is, right? I, I, I have a method, I have a function which takes three things. It takes the, um, the writer, the request and the DB. And then this method returns a function, whoops. Um, this method returns a function which takes um, HTTP, so let's write it here. Um, the, the, the stuff that this function returns is HTTP response uh, writer and HTTP request, HTTP request. Um, HTTP request, all right, um, and it returns nothing. Uh, and then you should put um, a logic here such that you have, um, it, it, it would effectively be the, the same. So you'd say return a func, uh, which takes those two things, which is kind of like this. Um, and does, does what it does. And then I will have the DB pass as a parameter to the closure and inside here, I would not need to have the reference to the global, uh, global DB. Of course, yeah, that should be, um, uh, the DB should be a reference. Right, so then I would have my code here uh, in such a way that I basically can pass the DB to those utility methods, uh, utility functions that I have, and I have the DB from here, and I have it from the server, right? So I would have, um, yeah, so I would pass DB here. I don't need to pass the reader and writer to for this method to generate me the ma the one that I really need in this place. So I can, I don't really need uh, this because as you see, it, it would not be used anyway. Uh, so I only need a handler student to take the DB and the handler student res uh, re responds with a function that takes those two parameters. And that's the logic of what the function does. Uh, and then inside that function, I would have uh, access to the DB. So that is much nicer and much cleaner. And then I have a proper DB and I don't have this global variable which hangs over there. I just have it here and then I pass it to the to the method. I pass it to the function which generates me a, another function which is required in that place. And the function that, that is required in that place is of a type of name with a response writer response uh, request, right? So response writer request. Uh, so then this, this call will return me the function of that type. Uh, and then it will kind of do the handling. Uh, and then I don't, I get rid of this. Um, I get rid of this, right? That should not be here. I should not have a global state inside my package for handling the database. Uh, there are multiple reasons for that. One reason is that I would like to mock it. So I would like to mock it as an in-memory storage for testing or as, um, uh, as a real database with some, with some database access and so on. So getting rid of this, um, simplifying that method to be simpler, like doing the post and get as two separate methods and then rewriting this method into a different method which just takes a database and returns me the the uh, HTTP handler uh, would kind of tidy up that code and make it kind of nicer because then I have access to what DB is and I can do, you know, I, I can do a different things here. So I can get, uh, get DB from above, uh, from here, or I can mock it, or I can do some other things and I can test how, how, the, how things work, right? So I can have an in-memory database or I can have a persistent storage database and it's up to me in this point to decide what the database is, not for the package to be to having that hard-coded. Um, so those are kind of the, the three 
the factoring tasks that I uh, decided that needs to be done here on the code that we had. Uh, again, I will kind of comment it out and I will uh, finish it and push it into the repository uh, such that you will see uh, how things could be improved and what you should avoid uh, doing. Like it worked, the code as it was written worked fine. It, there was no um, major like behavioral problems. It, it, it fulfilled the requirements. You could add an, um, students and look them up via the REST API, but it was written in a way that was not easy to change that into a persistent database store. It was a little bit hard to read the logic of that, of that particular function. And that particular function required to be rewritten into a higher order function to return the handler such that in our main, we can initialize, initialize the database properly and then have um, this kind of pass the database in, right? Um, there is one uh, final note on the um, on the structs or or the uh, DB uh, things that that we do, right? So let's have a look again on the student. So we have an interface, uh, and then we have a student struct, and then we have a student's DB struct, which is um, kind of the the placeholder, the storage for the uh, for the storage. And then the student's DB has a, a number of methods. Uh, and one of those methods is uh, init. So there is a bit of a weird pattern here because in, in, in main, what we really will need is we will need to, like if we, if we want to DB init, we would have to say uh, rest, rest student DB equals, um, what was the type? The type is uh, students DB. So we would need to say, uh, that's the package name, students DB, like this, right? We, we would need to uh, create a new students DB such that we can call a method on it. Uh, otherwise, we, we don't have it initialized, right? So it's a bit of a chicken and egg how that should happen. Uh, but um, either way, it's a little bit untidy and, and it would be nicer if we had, uh, if we turn it around and do a little bit more idiomatic way and go, which is we have um, a method called db in it. And this method returns, uh, so this method will return us a student's db type, which is initialized database, right? Uh, or uh, even better if we uh, return an instance of the, oops, of the interface, if we return that, right? So I don't want to expose, currently th those things are exposed to the, to the main package, but they should not be exposed. So what I ideally would like to have, I would like to have a method which is db init. So not like what we were doing here or with the global variable. So don't do that. Uh, have some uh, DB instance, and the DB instance would be of the of that type of the type of the interface. It will be student storage, right? So if I do it, um, if I write it uh, slightly differently, so I say var DB is rest student storage that infer the interface, and then DB is of that type. And I have a utility method which initializes to me the student storage. Uh, you can call it, you know, init student storage. And then I, I kind of hidden all the internals of, of those structs and how they, how they work. They probably like student DB should not be capital S. It should be small s. It should be hidden in the package. It should not be visible here. And then I have kind of an easy way of initializing the DB and then passing the the DB here because the other methods use the, you know, the DB methods for uh, for manipulating the uh, the instances. All right, so we we run out of time, but um, so th there were three things in the chat to be refactored: uh, use sets instead of slices, uh, always error handle, 
and use uh, channels as a mechanism for decoupling usually things that are coupled. Uh, and think about coupling, like think what needs to have reference to what and what doesn't, what you can do through channels, because using channels will kind of help you to decouple things and make them a bit more robust. In refactoring of the student server, uh, we had a global uh, state, which is bad, don't, don't do that. Uh, we were exposing too much to the main package, hide certain things, um, make functions logically organized such that our main handler was too complex. It was handling get and post in the same function, split it such that you deal with in, in se separate functions. Uh, and then passing something from here into the handler is done via this uh, higher order function, which generates a function, right? So I will kind of finish that off and I will put some comments here and then you can have a, have a look on the improved uh, code. All right, um, questions? For the, uh, if there are no questions for the, yeah, for the advanced programming people, I will uh, announce the assignment uh, probably tomorrow or over the weekend if I, uh, once I do the, the quality check. And then if you will have questions, then uh, use the issue tracker. It's good to use the issue tracker because then everybody will see questions and answers about the, about the assignment. Cool. So that's all for today. Um, thank you very much.